Good morning, good morning. I told Pastor Paul I needed his help, and look at he's laughing at me. Who knows what this is? Anyone? Do you know what it's for? Yeah, what's a hammer? There you go. So, if you don't know what this is, I'm going to give you a little bit of an instruction. You know, when we first mission trip we went on, Pastor Paul goes, I can't help you. I don't know how to use a hammer. Well, I surprised him and I bought him a drill because uh, that's what we took with us. So, this is an instrument. This is called a theodolite. Now, let's see if I break this. Give me a second. Give me one second. There you go. Does this look right? What's, it's kind of out, right? There's something wrong with it. Let's see if I can fix that. Kind of, kind of. You're probably wondering, what the, is he doing with this thing? This instrument is, I got to remember how to use it now. This instrument sets lines, makes things straight, sets, makes sure things in construction are straight up and down, distance this way. Uh, let me get into my message. You just look at that for a little bit, and I'll get to that. But this instrument is very, very crucial to everything we do in society. You wouldn't believe it, but, well, you might believe it. Did you know that the roads in Edmonton are made with an instrument like this? You wouldn't think so, because they're all over the place. But these instruments are used to give direction, set up roads, set up buildings. Uh, everything in construction starts with one of these. From the hole you dig in the ground to the building you put up to the road that leads to it starts with a, an instrument, something like this. At first I set it up and it was off kilted, right? It was, do you think that would work right? Do you think? Well, my message today it's called two degrees off. It's close enough, right? If we're, two, if we're only just two degrees off, it's close enough to get the job done, correct? Anybody agree with me? You know what? I'm going to show something here first. I don't know if he's in here, but can I see that picture, Patrick? Were you able to get that picture up there? Can you see this tree? Anyone see that tree? That's the tree that Yasid butchered in Mexico. He was given a little bit of instruction, and he went to town. It's kind of like being two degrees off, right, Yasid? He was told to trim it. So see all those branches? By the time he was done, there was only one stuck up in the middle. You remember that picture? Anyway, so you can take that down. I told him I would, I would share that out there. That's pretty much like everything we do, right? We need the proper instruction. We need the proper information. We need the proper tools to get the job done. But if we're just slightly two degrees off, three degrees off, it's going to cause us a lot of trouble down the road. So with that said, I've kind of gone through all of my stuff here but just by jumping all over the place. Um, what happens if we're off on our word? Right? Do you all have your Bible? I keep telling you, bring your written Bible. Who has a written word with them today? Right? Because the written word or the digital word, right, whatever you got, is what leads us and guides us, directs us. But if somebody changes this word, what will it do? It'll send us off course, correct? Remember what I, I told you that story about what's happening in China, right? In China, I mean, you've probably seen the videos. They're 
printing, the Chinese government now is printing Bibles to distribute to the people in China. And when I first said that, everyone's clapping, amen, amen, amen. But you know what they're doing? They're changing what's in the Bible to suit their own communist agenda, right? Um, the one story I heard, it talks about the story of Jesus when he uh, was confronted by the Pharisees about the woman who caught in adultery. And we all know the story. In the end, there was nobody there to condemn her. There was nobody there to stone her. And Jesus said to her, well, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. Well, in this new Bible coming out by the Chinese government, it says, and Jesus picked up a rock and stoned her to death. Don't you think that's going to mess with somebody's head? Hey, don't you think that's going to change what people believe about our God down the road? So we got to be very careful with the word, right? So let me ask you a couple things here. Who believes the Bible says that we can be healed? Amen? Amen? Everybody should put their hands up. If you don't, come and see me and I'll show you. Who believes that the Bible says that we should prosper even as our soul prospers? Hey, man, that's another good one, right? Give. You know, the Bible says, give and it shall be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, running out all over the floor. You'll have an abundance. Really, that's Lewis's way of, but you'll have more than you can contain. We've all heard that. We've, I've said that, right? Luke has said that. So my question today is, what happens if that doesn't happen? What happens if you come up front for prayer over and over and over again for healing and you never get healed? What do you do with that? What do you do with that information? What happens if you are faithful in your giving, in your tithes and your offerings, you sow into everything that God puts on your heart to sow, whether it's missions, whether it's the pantry and more, whether it's wells in Africa, whether it's the homeless people downtown Edmonton or even right out our front door and you give to the church, and you are always in a position of having to trust God to meet your needs. Question is, are you okay with that? Are you okay with not seeing your prayers answered on a daily basis? Let me ask you, how many, I'm going to ask, how many people in this house have had 100% of their prayers answered all the time? Anyone? I see one person with their hand up. Wow, a couple people, right? You know what I mean? Not too many people can say that their prayers have always been answered. But the problem with that is, For the most part, we're asking God to answer the prayers the way we want them to be answered. You know what I mean? Oh, God, I need this job. See this job, Lord, in the paper? See this job? I need this job. Man, I got debt. I got to pay my visa card off. I, I want to go on another holiday. You know what happens if God doesn't give you that job? Do you hold it against him? Right? Because you have a big visa bill, do you hold it against the Lord because you're not prospering because you're giving? You know, God works in us and through us. Everyone is different. And I'm going to read a scripture verse. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. It says, go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. This is what Jesus says. 
This is a commandment from the Lord Jesus Christ himself telling you, telling you, telling you, telling you, telling me to go and make disciples. How many of you here have a disciple? How many of you have somebody that you're discipling? How many of you have reached out and gone out of your comfort zone and says, I'm going to go share the gospel with that person. I am going to go and sacrifice my time, my energy, my finances to train that person up in the Lord. You know what? It's amazing for the most part. Most Christians do not believe it's their job to go make disciples. Oh, that's the pastor's job. That's Pastor Paul's job. That's Pastor Shelley's job. You know what the word says? What their job is? Their job is to instruct us to go make disciples. Yeah, they have their part to play in that. But it's not their job to go make disciples. It's their job to instruct us to go make disciples. That's what the word says. But we've gotten away from the word so much even two degrees puts us in error. Two degrees puts us in error. We put all the pressure on the pastor of the church, the leaders of the church, to do the work of the church when their job is to teach us and show us and have us do the work of the church. That's their job. But because we've become out of, because we've taken Go Make Disciples and we pay the pastor to be here, you know, 15 hours a day because he doesn't have a life. It's his job to go and do all of that stuff. Well, that's an error. That's an error. That's an error. So it says here, go baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, let me, let me get kind of into my message. Did you know there's a belief out there that if you baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, you're really not baptized? There's people that believe that, that you're not baptized. Well, Jesus says, go baptize in the name of the Father. I think I'm going to tend to believe in Jesus, amen? But some denominations, organizations, people believe that you can only baptize in Jesus' name only. Only, only, only. Why is that? I cannot figure out why they say that. I've had discussions about it. I've talked about it. I've debated about it. And I just thrown up my arms and says, who cares? If you baptize in Jesus' name or if you baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, man, people's lives are getting changed. They're getting turned on to Jesus. And they're saying, I surrender all. And they're willing to go through the waters of baptism leaving their sin behind and following Jesus. That's what counts. Amen? So partial truth, there's still truth there, but partial truth, is it truth or is it not? I don't believe it is. See, I can tell you a little bit of truth to get your ears to listen, and then when I change it, it doesn't bode well. You know, it talks about in the Bible, you know, Pastor Paul dealt with this last week. He says, any dot and little diddle, do not change it. Do not transform it. Do not redevelop it. Do not take it and make it sound so much better for today because the language of today. Right? It breaks my heart to hear denominations taking the word father out of the Bible taking the word father out of the Bible. They just don't understand. They don't understand what father means to so many of us. You know, I grew up with a dad. Good dad, good, good person as sorts, but he never had time for me. He never had time for me. We, he had 10 kids and he was spread so thin, you know, let the brothers take care of him. And you know what? He never had time for me, his youngest son. And you know what? I always gave him the excuse, well, that's okay. Dad's doing his best. But when I had an encounter with the Father God with, because Jesus came and rescued me, that changed me. That allowed me to understand what a father is to a son. That, un, that allowed me to, wow, 
Jesus died for me so that I could have a relationship with his father. And I can call him daddy. That transformed me. That changed me. That healed me. So when people take out the word father out of the Bible, they're, they're discarding all of that healing for so many people, whether it's males or females. They're taking that out and they're denying them to understand who the Father and the Father's heart truly is. Partial truths. Too many times in the church we've allowed truths to come in. I'm going to deal with this one because it's coming to this. Halloween. Wow, let's do a oh holy day. Let's do... You know, let's, let's celebrate Halloween, but we'll have a harvest festival, harvest party. Well, it's okay. We'll let the kids dress up, and, you know, they can be doctors and, and lawyers and princes and stuff. No, 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 no. You know, I was sharing with Pastor Paul. I was watching this one service. You might have seen it. This mother brings her daughter, her seven-year-old daughter, up for prayer in a church service. And immediately, the minister knew exactly what her problem was. And the minister addressed the mother and says, you've been allowing your daughter to watch programs. Yeah. And he addressed the spirit that was, the spirit that was in this little girl that was tormenting her and causing her to speak in, in a deep voice and growl and want to bite people and stuff was a demonic spirit. It was a spirit of a mermaid. The daughter loved mermaids, dressed up like mermaids all the time, wanted to be a mermaid. And so the mom thought, no problem, no problem. You know, she, the little girl was changing her identity. She wanted to be a mermaid. She wanted to be a mermaid. And this spirit attached itself to this little girl and tormented her for months and months and months. Couldn't put the girl in daycare because she would bite people. She would bite the boys and bite the girls, and, and she, it's just a horrible thing. And when the minister addressed it and dealt with it, the girl was released and set free. Power of God. Power of God working in people's lives. So when we say Halloween's okay, we say it's good, you know, you're just going for candy. You know, there's lots of stuff out there and information out there. But for years, I've known, like in Edmonton. Did you know in Edmonton, we have three large witches' covens in Edmonton? Three large ones where there's like hundreds of people that go to them. You know, they used to have one house in Riverbend that they would go to for the entire month of October. And they would have all of their stuff happening there, all leading up to Halloween. They would fast the entire month of October so that the demonic forces would influence Edmonton. And I, and I knew what was going on there because I had brothers and sisters that would go there and check the place out and thought it was weird and interesting and stuff. But then when I got saved and went to church and I heard about what they're praying for, you know, the whole month of October, witches around the world pray for the destruction of Christian families. They pray for the destruction of pastors in their cities. They fast for the entire month. The entire month they fast. And they believe that these demonic spirits are going to be released on Halloween night to cause havoc and chaos within their city. So when we allow Halloween to creep into the church, you know what? I'm going to leave it at that, but I would say stop. Stop. Cease and desist. Stop. Just say, Lord, I'm sorry. I didn't know, and leave it at that. Because time is coming short when we're going to make an account for every word we say, every action we do. And when we allow when we allow the things to come into the church that are so against the church, so against the Jesus that we serve, man, how are we going to answer to the Lord for that? What are we going to do?
Let me read this scripture. 2 Corinthians 2.17. This is Paul talking to the church about other people that would come through and, and, you know, preach or teach, you know, maybe a different doctrine, maybe a slant on something that was, that was said. And here's what it says. You see, we are not like human hucksters who preach for personal profit. We preach the word of God with sincerity and with Christ's authority, knowing that God is watching us. It's in the New Living Translation. That's what Paul was saying. Paul was saying when they preach the word, when they preach the word, he is fully aware that God is watching everything he says and everything he does. I wonder how many times I've taken the word out of context when I'm trying to tell somebody about Jesus because I just didn't know it, so I just sputed it off and said, this is what it says. Last week, Pastor Paul spoke on the undeniable, reliable word. If you weren't here, man, you got to go watch it. Go to YouTube, go watch it, go understand it, watch it again and watch it again and watch it again because... There's such a truth just in that, that sentence of what the message was about. The undeniable, reliable word. My takeaway from that was, if Jesus is no longer in the grave, then anything is possible. That's what the word teaches us, amen? If Jesus is no longer in the grave, anything is possible. The problem with that statement is, if we don't know our word, is anything possible? Is it really possible? Jesus says, go lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That's what he says. But if I don't know my word and the power of it operating in me and through me because of the Holy Spirit living in me, how can I make that word come alive, not just in me, but in the person I'm praying for? Too many times, faith ministers, faith healers, they, they go and they pray for somebody for healing, whether it's cancer, a bad back, a cold, headaches, whatever it is, and then when they don't get healed, they ask them, well, what sin do you have in your life? What's stopping God from healing you? Personally, I think that's a twist of what the Scripture's talking about. Because my Bible says, go hands on, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It has nothing to do with, with their faith. It has everything to do with what I know in the Word. Tell you a story. When I was... Uh, 25, 26 years old, something like that. Now, that's a long time ago, so i got to remember. I, I, one of my brothers developed rheumatoid arthritis really bad. He started getting it at about 15, 16 years old, and by the time he was 30 years old, he had to quit his job. He couldn't walk anymore. He couldn't bend over. He basically had to sit most of the day and couldn't work. Couldn't get help from the government, anything like that, because he's a young man, should build a work. I came up from Calgary, and I went to visit him, and I didn't know how bad it was. And man, my heart broke for him. And I said to him, I said, you know, Tracy, have I ever done anything to hurt you or harm you? Purposefully? He said, no. I said, and would I ever do anything that would hurt you or harm you on purpose? He says, I don't think so. I said, can I pray for you? Can I lay hands on you and believe for the God that I believe in to heal you? And he said, yes. So we prayed. We prayed, and Holy Spirit came upon me, and I started praying in the Spirit, and, 
and started praying over things in his life. And, and I started praying, you know, God, heal him. Top of his head to the soles of his God, move his hips around. God, take the pain out of his knees. And, you know, after about 25 minutes, 30 minutes of just praying, you know, he had no pain left in his body. He could bend over and touch the floor from a standing position without touch, bending his knees. He could move around. He could pull his knees up to his chest. And I'm like, God, how come I can't do any of that stuff? And you know what the amazing thing about that was? He had no faith. He didn't believe in Jesus. Even after that, he didn't turn his life over to the Lord. So why would the Lord heal him? Would the, does, does the Lord heal people for their benefit or for his benefit? His benefit, right? It doesn't matter whether you're a believer or not. The Lord, if he wants to heal you, he's going to do it. It's for his benefit, right? The Lord heals who he, who he heals, and then sometimes the Lord doesn't heal who he doesn't heal. I think of the man that was sitting by the pool of Bethesda. You know, there was this pool there, and when the angels came and stirred the water, and the first one in, you know, gets healed, right? Like, like rodeo, Woo, let's go, right? I always wondered why it was only the first one. But do you think it was, it was the first one? Because it was the person that got in there first was the one that really wanted it the most, Right? Well, Jesus has this encounter with this guy. And Jesus basically says, so what do you want? And the guy's complaining, well, I don't have this and I don't have that. I don't have someone to help me to get into the pool. And blah, 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 blah. Jesus said again, what do you want? Well, I want to be healed. Jesus touched him and says, pick up your mat. Go. Guy got healed. As soon as the guy made motion to pick up his mat, he got healed instantly like the guy's been there for years and he instantly got healed i've heard faith people take that story not just faith people but people take that story and they slash it and they tear it apart and they you know and they just make nonsense out of it because they can't believe that jesus would go and heal just that one person Meanwhile, there's all these other people around the pool that needed a healing, right? I've had these debates with people and stuff. If Jesus healed 100% of everybody he came in contact with, do you think that every town he went to, there would be 100% health in that town? Because he came in contact with virtually everybody. But Jesus didn't heal everybody. He healed those that he was purposed to go touch that day or that hour or that moment, right? Think of the story when Jesus fed the 5,000 or the 3,000. He ministered to them all that whole day before. And then in one, one scripture says, and he healed all their sicknesses. He healed all their sicknesses. Man, that would have taken a long time, eh? 3,000 people, 5,000 people to heal all of them. And these are just the men they're talking about. But he healed all of them. So does the Bible lie to us when it says he'll heal us and we don't get healed? No. No. I've suffered from a bad back because of things I've done in my life for years. Getting hurt at work, not paying attention. Getting hurt at work breaking the rules, getting hurt, driving a car too fast, running a red light, getting in an accident. You know, there's consequences to some of the things I've done in my body. Can God overlook that? Yes, God can overlook that. But you know what? I realize, man, Lord, why do I have to keep coming to you for prayer for my back? Why do I have to go to the chiropractor on a weekly basis just so that I can move around? Why do I have to believe for you so that I can get out of bed in the morning. And you know what his comment to me has been over the years? Who else are you going to believe in? Who are you going to trust? What are you going to do if you have a 
full and complete body, who are you going to trust? Are you going to forget about me? You know, I was telling Pastor Paul the other day, I said, oh, man, I just wish I could win a lottery. Oh, so I wouldn't have to worry. I could be independently wealthy. And he said to me, do you think God could trust you with funds like that? I don't think he knew what he was really saying to me. Like, he wasn't, it wasn't anything bad, but really, how many of us, if we won lots of money, whatever it is, would trust God for our finances after that? You know, when people say, I want to be independently wealthy, who do you want to be independent from? Right? My Bible says, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. It doesn't say, my God shall supply all of my needs according to my heart's desire, everything I want and everything I believe I need. It doesn't say that. It says it's going to supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Plain and simple. If God doesn't believe I, I deserve or need to have all of his riches, I don't need to have all of his riches. I remember growing up, and I remember people saying all the time, my God owns a thousand cattle on a thousand hills, and they're mine. Okay, where would you put them? <laughs> okay, where would you put them? Right? Too many times we take scripture out of context. Too many times we allow people to speak words over us, justifying them with half scriptures, partial scriptures, some scripture, no scripture. And then we ask God, why? Why haven't you moved in my life? Pastor Kelly Stickle wrote a book. And it's called My Victory Starts Here. If you haven't read the book, we got, we got a few around. I, I encourage you to get it. Because there's a couple of things in the book, a statement that he makes in there. Well, it might, well i got to remember now. It might not be in the book, but when he was doing the teaching, he says, if you can believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sin and that he was raised again from the dead and that he lives today, if you can believe that, what does it matter if you believe that Jonah was swollen by a whale? It doesn't matter. The starting point is your faith in believing that Jesus died for you. That's the starting point. There's men that have studied these scriptures for years, decades. They know this book inside and out, but they don't believe that Jesus died and rose again. They don't believe that. I know people that have read this Bible, and they can go, oh, look at that language change in there. That's a different writer. I'm like, what? These guys are linguistics. They know, they know how to read and determine penmanship. And I'm like, does it matter that it changed the writer? Does it matter? So let me ask you. If God chose not to answer your prayer concerning whatever it is today, would it change how you feel about him? Would he still be Lord of your life? Would you still go to him in prayer? Why do we pray? We pray because God answers prayer. We know that. But what if? What if? So my message is two degrees off. I think that's okay, right? Two degrees off? No. The scripture is absolutely clear. We're not to change it. We're not to adapt it to suit our own needs. We're not to manipulate it. We're not to take it for our own benefit to prosper. What happens if somebody does? What happens if somebody 
uses the word of God to prosper from it. You know, there is these guys in the New Testament, and they were doing the very thing. And these, the church, they came to Paul and said, well, what about these guys? We should stop them. And didn't he say, but isn't Christ being preached? Isn't Christ being preached? So God allows what God allows. God does what God does. And basically what we have to come to an understanding that we have to be okay with it. We have to be okay with what God does. Because, you know, God knew you. He knew me. He knew this building. He knew everybody in Edmonton. He, he knew us all before the beginning of time. And he knew that we would sin. And he knew that we would question. And he knew that we would come to faith in believing in him. He knew it. Nothing surprised the Lord. If we think, if we think, oh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm this or I'm that, does it surprise God? No, it doesn't surprise God. And it doesn't surprise God also when we let our pride Stop us from coming to ask Jesus for healing. When we let our pride stop us from repenting because of sin in our lives. You know, our pride stops us even from opening up this word. Opening up this word. I've known people, I've already read it twice, I don't need to read it again. That's their pride. You know, in Rooted, we're doing Rooted, and, and I shared with the rest of our class that I was watching this pastor, and he made this statement, and it goes something like this. What's more important, prayer or Bible study? What's more important, prayer or Bible study? You know, and some said, oh, well, prayer. Prayer is more important than Bible study. You know what the answer is? The word is more important than prayer. Because as we saturate ourselves with the word of God, the undefiled word of God, and we know it inside and out, we know what it says about us, we know what it says about God. We know what it says about Jesus, the Holy Spirit. We know what it says. Then when we go to pray, we pray what the Word says. Because if you don't know the promises of God and what He says over you and for you, then how can you pray and believe for what He says is for you? Church, I want to encourage you. Be okay with God doing what God does. Be okay with maybe the Lord holding back on, on your breakthrough. But never stop believing that he's going to come through for you. Because your breakthrough might be swift. My breakthrough could be years down the road. But that shouldn't stop us from praying and believing that God is working in us. You know, some of, the, some of the things about Scripture, have you guys ever seen movies or documents on a church that believes that to worship the Lord, you have to have snakes in your hand? You have to play with snakes and you got to do all that stuff? Is that weird? That's weird. You know where they get that from? Jesus said, and you shall handle serpents and snakes, and they won't hurt you or harm you. So there's this group of believers. They, they truly believe in Jesus, but they believe to really worship and trust the Lord, you have to be able to handle a snake that wants to kill you. Didn't Jesus say to the devil, don't tempt the Lord your God? Right? Don't tempt the Lord your God. You know, there's, 
there's a church out there. I'm not going to give you the name, but I've, I've worked with a few guys from it. You know what they believe? They believe that only, that only a few hundred people are truly sons and daughters of God. And not even really daughters, because daughters are second class. But they have churches around Canada and the United States and one in Europe. And in, they believe in this whole doctrine that you have to sacrifice everything, that if you have sin in your life, that sin needs to be rid of your life. And you know how I found all of this about him? I was sharing about my son who has some life challenges. And this guy went crazy. He went ballistic. You need to put your son down. That's what he told me. You need to, if he has sin in his life like that, he's into witchcraft. He's into the stuff that draws him further away from God. He says, you need, your son needs to be put to death. And I, 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 and I looked at him. I said, there's no grace in what you believe? He goes, grace is for those that are called sons and daughters of God and nobody else. I said, to him, well, how do other people come to the knowledge of Jesus? Well, nobody else is going to come to the knowledge of Jesus because only this portion is left. They actually believe that Jesus has already returned and he's gone. And now we're just the remnant leaving this earth one by one. And this is a doctrine that came from a healing evangelist back in the early 1900s. This guy was on fire. People were getting healed in his ministry. He would have crusades, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 people, and not one person would leave not being healed. But he became so puffed up in what he believed that he was healing the sick that he started his own denomination and he started his own belief system and he started changing the word saying, well, that, that was interpreted wrong. This is what it says. And we got these churches around. Sideways to Sundays. It like baffles me. So with that said, would you love God more if he answered all your prayers? Let's be honest. If God answered all your prayers, would you love God more? Would you serve him more? What would you do? Or if he made you wait or didn't answer your prayer at all, would you love him less? These are questions that we need to ask ourselves. We're all at a different level. We're all at a different level. And I had to, I'm going to share a little bit about my, my daughter. I had to deal with her on this level. She lost a baby a while ago, right? She had a miscarriage, and, and she was blaming God. Oh, God hates me. God doesn't love me. Why would the God that you keep telling me about and that I gave my life to, why would he allow this to happen? She took it just really hard. Like, I'm a dude, right? So in my opinion, she took it harder than what I thought she should. But then, you know, I talked with Pastor Shelley, and she said, but you're, you're, not a, you're not a lady, you're not a, you're not a mom. So I had to go back to my daughter, and I had to really console her. And, and so it, it took a while to get over that. Well, I can say it now, my daughter, married, is pregnant. She's going to have a baby. So Aaliyah and Luke, they're going to have a baby, so they're going to have little cousins right close to each other. And... She started having some trouble, and she started reverting back to the same thing. Man, why does God hate me? Why am I so sick? Why can't, you know what? He's going to take this baby from me, isn't he? You know what? I got mad at her again. I got, I got upset. I said, why would you be like that? And I had to realize again, Pastor Shelley, in the back of my head, you've got to respond to her with kindness and love her and cherish her. Okay. Lord, help me through this. And, and I had to talk her through the fact that, you know what? When we have the word of God in us, right? Anxiety has no room in us. Get that? When we have the word of God in us, anxiety has no room in us. That's not to slam people that suffer from anxiety. But you know what? 
It is true. When we fill ourselves with the word of God to overflowing so much that our bodies, our spirit can't contain it, that it just has to come out, there's no room for anything else. There's no room for anything else. So what would you do if God didn't answer your prayers? Let me address this other other one here. I remember years back, I think we're like eight years in planting the church over here, and, and this Christian brother comes in, and I've known the guy for four or five years, and he's just, wow, brother, I've been set free. I've been, I'm like, oh, wow, what's that? And he starts talking to me about this new grace that is sweeping through the church and how the church has held back on the grace of God so much. And this new grace frees him to do whatever he wants. He goes, my wife and I, we've embraced this so much. And these guys are youth pastors. We have different relationships with other people. We, you know, the grace of God has allowed us to still be married but have other relationships. And I think I just both fell over. I couldn't believe that this guy that I knew preaches the gospel, believes the same things that I believe in, but he's taken the grace of God to the degree, well, it allows him to sin willfully. So I had to ask my question over the years. If a person can sin willfully, I've asked Pastor Paul this question too. If a person can sin willfully, like willfully go and commit adultery, willfully go and rob your neighbor, willfully go and do whatever sin it is, willfully do it, and sleep that same night without being kind of, without the Holy Spirit saying, come on, man, what are you doing? Come on, man. They can do it with no problem. Got to question whether they're even saved. Or maybe, maybe it's just they sin so much that their conscience is so seared that the Holy Spirit can't get through to them anymore. That the Holy Spirit can't get through to them anymore. So what is it? Do we take the word? to suit our own needs so that we can sin, take the word to suit our own needs. You know, Brother Luke, despite what you and your dad think, tithing is not of the New Testament. Okay, well, like Luke says, Jesus gave it all. All he requires is us just to give him something back. But really, he requires everything, right? He requires everything of us. We can't give him just a portion of us, whether it's our time, our talents, our treasures, ourselves, our spirit. We can't give him just that little bit. We have to give it all to him, right? He gave it all to us. He wants us to give it all to him, right? Like Luke said today, it was good. He makes us a steward over our time, our treasures, and our talents, a steward over that. Too many times we remove the truth out of the word, because we want to be unfaithful, because we want to be ungrateful, because we want to keep what we feel is ours. Hebrews 11, if you haven't read it, read Hebrews 11. There's a lot in there. Hebrews 11, now by faith, or now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things yet not seen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things yet not seen. Jesus is our hope, amen? Jesus is our peace, amen? Jesus is our healer, amen? Our abundance. And many, 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 many other things Jesus is to us. Too often we take, oh, Jesus is our abundance, we're going to be wealthy. No, Jesus is our abundance. Jesus is all we need. Jesus is all we need. 
So if you go through Ephesians, Hebrews 11, it has this whole story of all these great men and women of God. By faith, Moses rejected Pharaoh's house. By faith, Moses led the people through the children of there. By faith, Abraham listened to the voice of God and left his homeland to go. By faith, Abraham and Sarah had a child. By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. All it takes is faith to believe God, to move in our lives. But then if you read the second part of that, it says, and they were persecuted. These are people in the New Testament. And they were persecuted for their faith. And they had their heads chopped off for their faith. And they were drawn and quartered for their faith. And they were lied about. And they were misused. And they were abused. They were whipped. They were scourged for their faith. What does it say? But in the end, they remained faithful. So whether they abounded and had all these victories and, and, you know, all this great stuff happening, or whether they were persecuted, abused, whipped, killed, they remained faithful. They never received their promise. They never received their promise. Notice how it says promise. That word promise, they never received their promise. They were promised something in the Old Testament as well as something in the New Testament. In the New Testament, we have the Holy Spirit living and guiding us inside of us. Did you know in the Old Testament, when the Holy Spirit wanted to do something, it went and rested upon them? It didn't rest in them, but it rested upon them. So they had the same Holy Spirit. You think David killed Goliath just because he was a good shot? No. No, he didn't. David killed Goliath because Goliath had to die. And God said, he's going to die. Will you daily give him your first and your best concerning your time, your talents, and your treasures? Or will you withhold? I'm going to say it again. If we taint the word of God and only take out what's important to us that we fill, we're going to be off. Just like the foundation of a building. If the building's off two, three degrees, that building could lean to right or to the left. You've seen those pictures where the buildings are leaning like this? I think they made a mistake. They didn't do it on purpose, even though they might say they did. They made a mistake. Too many times we take the word of God and we abuse it by not reading it, by not reading it thoroughly, and not studying it, not getting it inside of us so that we can benefit from it instead of the Lord's kingdom being lifted up. Amen? I'm going to finish with this. We are a church for all people to come and deepen and strengthen their relationship with Jesus Christ to have a firm foundation in his word is the key to that relationship. If you never get into this word, if you never open it up, how are you going to know what God has for you? How are you going to know what to stay away from? How are you going to know what God did in the past and what he's doing in the present and what he's going to do in the future? How will you know unless you get into the word? Amen.